In the old days, most of the visitors were Tipperary farmers, men who'd got the hay in, the corn threshed, the cow bulled, and cork bet. Today, they still come here, but so do thousands of young people from all over Ireland to dance and drink and sing and, well, you name it. But they also come to take the water to drink or bathe in the sulphur or manganese baths, which for more than 150 years have been the fountainhead, if you like, of all Listoon Varna's fortunes. The Victorian passion for the strange science of the hydropath may be dead in Harrogate or even Bath, but it still goes on here. Not on the old scale, perhaps. In 1911, 15,000 people took the waters here. Last year, the figure was down to 5,000, but it still has its devotees. Ooh, don't like. Oh, no, they. No, they. Uh, I'm perfectly candid with you about this. Uh, I suffered a kind of a stiffness on my shoulder. And uh, I met my boy one day and I come down here, went into to the whales, into the pump room. And uh, I told him. And he said, what do you have a bath, boss? And that's as I said, I don't believe in those things at all. <laughs> But it's more than farmers from Tip and bathers who come to Listoon Van. It's always been a great town for the bank clerk. And for the clergy. Well, to my mind, uh, it's the, 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 the people that you meet here and um, as well as that, most of the, of the clergy that come here suffer from rheumatism of one form or another. Eh? And they find, as I do, that these, uh, the baths and the waters are good for rheumatism. So he put me into the bath like he put me in here now, and he uh, left me soaking for about maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And it was nice and comfortable. And he came in and he said, which of the shoulders are giving you trouble? So, uh, I, I talked to him. He said, did, did, did you get any medical advice on this? Well, it's a joke in the eye, I said, medical advice. Is it in fact as popular with the clergy as it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago, or are they going to other places? I think it's still as popular as it was then. I've been coming here for a number of years, and I meet uh, the same old friends uh, year after year, both clerical and lay. Do you find any changes in the place as the years have gone on? Is it becoming more modern or more noisy? Uh, as far as this hotel itself is concerned, there's more latitude today than there used to be, say, 20 years ago, when uh, Miss Aggie de Ware was here in, uh, in, uh, as the proprietress. Um, more latitude in what way? The, that they're allowed to remain up longer at uh, night and to uh, keep on the, the singing and dancing longer than they used to. is gay and bright and the late hours at night is a change. All the other seaside resorts, well, they seem to finish up at 12, but here they go on until 5 in the morning. Scenes that can be matched in many a hotel and pub in the village, and it goes on for hours and hours and hours. But it's more than just the gaiety and the drinking and the dancing that brings the young and the not so young here. For the girls, Listoon Varna is where the boys are.
come looking for husbands. Do any of them have any luck on many of them? They do, yes. What about the, the business of all the girls coming here looking for fellas? Is there any truth in this? Yes. <laughs> what about you? Well, no. If I meet a nice fellow, yes, but not looking for one. But no, I'm not here. looking for a boyfriend here. I prefer one from around home. You can meet your husband at a bus stop or anywhere. Holidays, well, yes, you can meet somebody, but uh, all the romances don't necessarily last. Not looking for a husband, <laughs> but if I meet a nice fellow, it'll be nice. Well, you'll get that in any place, won't you? People yes, will exactly. meet. I mean, it's been going on for years. I'm not looking for a husband. You know, I'm just not. I'm one of. I'm just one that isn't looking for a husband. Well, now, some girls may, but um, I don't think they could. Um, well, there's always tension if you have that feeling, and there's certainly no tension around here. <laughs> dancing in the morning in the wells. That's where you make the click. The tradition of informal matchmaking is an old one here, though people may joke about it. A lot of couples meet, court and marry through holidays in Listoon Varna. Like this couple. Well, I was actually brought just in a party and came along. And um, that was it. I didn't, uh, it wasn't my choice of a holiday. I was just included in it. Party. And did, did you think you'd meet a husband here? N genuinely, no, I didn't really. No. But you'd, you'd heard all about the traditional... Oh, I'd heard all about the traditional matchmaking down here and I sort of laughed at it, really. You didn't think it could happen to you? No, I didn't. And what about you, Michael? What, what brought you here in the first place? I suppose you could say the same. I come down with a party and... Father and mother have been coming here for years. It's supposed to be a great, great place, a great life, great, and which it is. Did you sort of deliberately come looking for a girl? Oh that no, ah uh, no, I came out for a bit of fun. And you, you both come here since you've been married each year. Yes. <laughs> It's hard to know where to find relaxation in this dune. One can only wonder how all the visitors can stand the pace. <laughs> the air must be good, all right, because people survive and they come back the next year young, old and middle-aged. I think there's something in the air here <laughs> that you just seem to be able to endure it. We're just here to have a week's holiday and enjoy ourselves. But I don't know any place, any resort uh, where you have the hospitality and uh, lack of tension and smiles all around. <laughs> The late nights. Very <sighs> well, how do I look? You look well to me. <laughs> well, I wasn't in bed since yesterday. It's a late night area. This is nice work, really. Is it a good thing, do you think, to allow people to stay up cavorting and singing and drinking till five yeah. and six in the morning? But, but why, when people are enjoying themselves, why, why restrain them? They come here for a holiday, and if that's their holiday, why not let them have it? 
It's hardly a relaxing holiday, then, is it, Father? Well, uh, I'd say it is, uh, but um, a lot of people uh, I know require a holiday after Liston Van. <laughs> We've been playing golf of a kind here for a great many years, but now we're uh, in the course of uh, making a proper 18-hole golf course. A uh, great part of the construction work is being done by the members of the golf club itself as part of the general community effort here at the airport. When I came here some 20 years ago as an airport doctor, there was very little indeed here. A temporary terminal building, some uh, wooden, small wooden buildings, uh, some storehouses, very little else. Uh, in fact, just here where, we, where we're standing now was the end of the main runway at that time. In the last 10 years, there have been tremendous changes. A new runway was built, the industrial estate was started, and the new housing area was built. Over there, you can see the head offices of the development company. The uh, Shannon Free Airport Development Company Limited was established early in 1959 with the objective of ensuring the future development of the airport. Uh, this involved the development of an industrial estate which would attract uh, employment to this area and of course involved the need to provide uh, for a town plan. At the present time we have 42 firms at Shannon, 25 manufacturing and the balance uh, in service in, uh, activities. Um, of the people working at Shannon, now numbering three and a half thousand or a little more, uh, approximately 700 are living in the community and with their families they make up a total population of now slightly over 2,000 living uh, in the community at Shannon. Uh, a, a community centre was established in the early stage of this development to cater for the needs of the people and there are over 30 clubs and organisations associated with this hall. Uh, a, a community officer is employed by the development company to encourage such activities and to help families in settling in. There are three schools uh, in Shannon, uh, two primary schools and one comprehensive school. Most of the 2,000 people living at Shannon are Irish, but there are a certain number of those from other countries also living here. My name is Jim Parry. I work for an American company at Shannon. I came to Shannon uh, six years ago from Manchester. I'm married to an Irish girl. I take an active interest in community activities. I'm chairman of the Shannon Community Association and a member of the parish committee. I'm also involved in the Shannon Junior Club and in a committee that's uh, specially formed to raise funds for a swimming pool. I hope to see this pool in Shannon by 1968 I'm Gus Barrett. I came from Waterford originally. I came to Shannon about 1960. I work as a maintenance fitter here with Shannon Diamond, a South African firm. I'm secretary of the parish committee and I helped start Club Nishana, which is now a branch of Conra Nagaila. Being in Shannon revived my interest in the Irish language and in Irish things generally. We need a five off this, make it a five four. What size do you want? So you want ten by eights. You want to change your condensers up there. You okay? Yeah, okay. Right. I want to dust that too. I came to the airport here in about 58, but in those days, you'll appreciate, there was nothing but the terminal building. This industrial estate wasn't even thought of. I left the airport then. I went to America, about 61, where I got married. I returned to Ireland and worked for a while on a national newspaper in Dublin before coming back down to Shannon. This time I joined the development company as chief photographer and we set up house on the 
housing estate. My wife, who uh, came from the city, city of Dublin, actually likes us so much down here and has made so many friends among the neighbours that she often vowed she'd never go back to city life. I think community life is very good here in Shannon. As a Dutchman, of course, family life with my wife and children is very important. For my children, I think it's wonderful how many people are willing to give their spare time in the evenings to entertain them and help them. And uh, Father Gainer is the man who could tell you much more about them. Shannon Airport in the past has been called the crossroads of Europe. Today it is a crossroads in a different sense. The new town of Shannon is still part of the old parish of Newmarket and Fergus. When I came to live here four years ago, there was about half the present population living here. There was no church or school. And since then, Canon Barry, the parish priest of Newmarket and Fergus, has been personally responsible for the building of a new church and school here and has rendered other sterling service to this community. At the same time, he has given me a free hand to busy myself with problems of community and parish development. Certain needs will be felt in any new community, and the community itself will set about filling these needs. For instance, the need for social life among the women folk led to the establishment of the Irish Country Women's Association here. The Credit Union is another organisation that comes to mind. It's so important for young housemaking couples. And the Shannon Community Association, which brings to the notice of the development company the needs of the people living here. The development of the parish committee is an example of how a community fulfills its own needs. The primary purpose of the parish committee, which was set up four years ago, was to secure a new church. As time went on, of course, the Vatican Council took place with its emphasis on lay participation in the affairs of the parish. So that now we could truly say that the parish committee and the people of the parish take full part in all decisions relating to parish life. Off Spanish Point from here. Spanish Point, of course, is called because uh, what there the Spanish Armada yeah. once came in. Yeah, right. yeah. And these people down on the shore are actually gathering uh, this uh, seaweed, um, carrageen, and what have you. And there's nobody better to tell me what it's all about than... Uh, Mr Casey, what exactly happens to all this seaweed? Uh, after they have dried it, it's um, transported to the factory, the Irish Marine Products in Kilrush. Yes. And it's there processed. And uh, I believe the iodine and magnesium contents of this is proving a very big factor in the animal feeding I see. Now, nowadays. Yes. And what exactly, the carrageen, for instance, I know we know carrageen as a, a food or a dessert, but what exactly do they use it for? Uh, what's the principal use for it down here? Commercially, I believe the biggest use of it is used as a stiffening process, even in. Uh, say ice cream and uh, toothpaste and th oh, things I of see. that nature. Yes. So it is d now that is only a recent development, this is a very new industry down it's here. It's a very new industry, yes, but it's developing. Would you say this industry is replacing the fishing for instance? Yes, I'd say so to a big extent. Uh, it's the main source of income for the local people here. I see. And what can they earn uh, at this work, Mr Casey? Well, let's say uh, an average family where there's two or three people working together, I suppose they can have, for six months of the year, they can have a fair living of about, I'd say, six to eight pounds a week. Well, that's very, very yeah. good. And is it very hard to harvest it? Yes, depends on the weather. Of course, I mean, they yes. have to have the dry weather and their labours are often completely in vain. If they get complete wet weather all the time, it can melt completely into the into the ground. You know? So you, in fact, did welcome the storms that brought in this seaweed and rooted it up from the... From the the bed of the, of the sea here? Oh, very much so. <laughs> Especially the factory owner in Mr. Glen, he likes big quantities of this weed and it depends on the roughness of the weather to uproot it outside to get it in here well, for that, harvesting. Well, that appears to be the story down here in Quilty and everybody is working very hard. We wish you well and uh, good harvesting of the seaweed in Quilty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is to let no unauthorised person down the pier during the period that the foreign boats are birthed there. I agree with the appointment, but I think it gives us all a bad name. It's unfair to the rest of the girls in the town. Yeah, I think the whole thing is ridiculous. It's a waste of public money, I think. Do you know what they're talking about? They're talking about the decision of the Kilrush 
uh, Harbour Board to appoint two policemen to do duty on the docks. They say that unauthorised people, particularly young girls, are going down on board ships under the cover of darkness. And the people, particularly the women of Kilrush, are up in arms against this decision. They say it is giving them all a bad name. It certainly does give us a bad name. There are only a few girls in the town who bother with sailors and we all know who they are. Only a very few incidents, to my knowledge, as I have uh, good public knowledge. And uh, it's no worse than any other port town of its size in Ireland. And you were on the harbour board for some time yourself? I was on the harbour board for ten years. And an incident like that never came up. Well, this is Kappa Pier, Kilrush. Uh, there's occasion to all the talk. And as you can see, it's quite a small pier stretching out to Scattery Island. And the man who proposed the, that the two policemen be implied is Mr. Jack Finlan, chairman of the harbour board. Do you think it was really necessary to appoint the two policemen for such a small pier? Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Quinlan, I don't look at it as a very small one. It's a quite a little busy port for the size of it. But uh, we found it necessary uh, due to public opinion. Uh, it's private property, and uh, when a board has been unloaded in this pier, there's quite a danger that, uh, well, the public could get uh, injured in any way while boats and trucks are using this pier. Uh, we are entitled, of course, uh, as a board to appoint two watchmen or protectors to keep the public off of this while a board has been unloaded or discharged. It's the only time they're on it. They're not full time. It's just a part time job. But they've been called dock policemen. That is correct. Well, it's a term, uh, probably kind term that we call them dock policemen, but actually they're watchmen are protecting property and saying that uh, the public won't get into any harm by going down this pier while the boat is in. Yes, but during the discussion it was mentioned that the, that the girls were also going down the pier at night um, mm. and quite a number of the girls we spoke to already in Kilrush were quite indignant. Well, Mind uh, you, I must admit, some of them did, did say that it was necessary. Well, it's a common thing, I think, in most parts. I mean, boats are an attraction, both the female as well as the male. And um, it doesn't not necessarily mean that this any lady or young or any ladies that go on this pier would have any interest in the board otherwise than it was an attraction. It's an attraction to all ages, young and old. And uh, the whole um, background of this is that we've just wanted to, uh, as I said, protect the public from getting injured probably in any way. Now, you're a member of the National Board of Harbour. What do you... That's, uh, I'm the representative mm. of the smaller ports and the Irish Port and Docks Association. Do you think that other Irish ports, small ports, should take the same precautions you're taking in I the think Rush? I think they should. In fact, I, I'm going to propose it to, to the board of chair, chairman of that uh, we have it on the agenda for the next um, annual general meeting of the Irish Port and Docks Association. Because uh, every dock has its own little problem. I mean, it's a problem generally all over the world that uh, people are attracted to boats. I won't say for possibly a lot of reasons. They like to meet foreign people and uh, chat with them. We get on very well with all boats that come in here with the crew of all the boats here. They've made quite a lot of friends here in this town, captains of ships and the people here are in a very friendly nature. But as far as uh, the publicity of the having... Their people, it seems, like to get to the bottom of things, especially the sea. John Philip Holland from Liscannor was the father of the American submarine, and now James Tierney from Cora Finn, the father of ten children, has decided to make a do-it-yourself voyage to the bottom of the sea, or to be more immediate and perhaps less ambitious, to the bottom of Lake Inchiquin near his home. For he has built a homemade one-man submarine and plans to take her below once sea trial. Mind you, not everyone would accompany the 37 years old garage owner, even if there was room, which there isn't anyway. But this submarine is made of four strong steel barrels, 
powered by a 24 volt battery and a starter motor from a bus. It is not fully completed. Tanks which will control the diving have yet to be fitted to each side, but in theory they work. So far, in fact, all systems are go. Though in this technological age, Mr. Tierney's 11 foot light grey submarine looks like an amphibious. Any idea of what's going to happen once you go underwater? It's balanced perfect over water. Naturally, it's going to be balanced perfect underwater. I should have thought that buoyancy and balancing were experts' jobs. Now, as a non-expert, how have you made yourself so familiar with these problems? Well, I first started at home with my in the kitchen sink with a flask, an ordinary flask, and uh, added pieces of lead to the bottom of it, strapped it onto a tape, and started from there on with measurements and weight and worked it out to that scale, as you can see. And your, your idea is that what, what's okay for the kitchen sink is okay for the lake? Yes. If you'll forgive my pessimism, let's take this now from the worst possible angle. What happens if something goes wrong? C can you get out of the submarine? Yes, I certainly can. I have a hatch door fitted on it, um, safety valves, and I have a little transmitter, which I built myself, and I will be in communication with the land. If anything do go wrong, I have enough oxygen to keep me down there for at least an hour and a half. I know this submarine does have transmitters, but does it have any other equipment? I have to fit two balanced tanks on the side of her, an extra motor to pump water into those tanks, and pump it back out again when I went to surface. Mr. Tierney, what's really the point of this? How does a garage owner suddenly become a submarine builder? Well, I was always anxious to build something. I did build a small aeroplane once, a few years ago, and uh, I was stopped by our local priest and sergeant. So they suggested building a speed a speedboat. From there on, I just thought of this little submarine. When do you think you'll be ready to launch this sub? Oh, next spring, I hope. Behind every successful man, there's a woman's encouragement, they say. And Mary Tierney fully backs her husband. I think it's marvellous. A lot of people talk of doing those things, but they never seem to finish them or try to do them. But will you worry about him? No, I will not worry. Because uh, he's a good swimmer. And he, I know that if he gets into difficulties underwater, he'll eventually be able to come up himself. But what about you? Would you go down in the submarine? I would. I'd love to, if I could swim. This village of Newmarket and Fergus had about 450 people, while today it has almost 900, and the district around has grown to 2,500 people, which is twice its previous population. Professor Veracruz of Leiden University in Holland was so intrigued with this development that he carried out a survey here in this whole district in 1961. He reported that of the 1951-56 census of population for rural Ireland, every place had decreased at the rate of about uh, 5 to 6 percent, but Newmarket and Fergus grew by 12 percent during that period alone. 
He said that there was no other locality in the county, or in most parts of Ireland, which had had any kind of development of this nature. Uh, he said it was due, of course, to Shannon Airport and the industrial estate. One of the results of that is that um, uh, the marriage rate has increased uh, to such an extent that I would say that we have double the amount of marriages in this parish that we had, say, ten years ago. And uh, young people are marrying, marrying very young uh, brides from 18 up. And uh, then there is a great increase in child population, and that's uh, has become obvious in the schools. Now, uh, in the last 15 years, we have had to uh, employ six additional teachers in this parish. And uh, the Church of Ireland have had to employ a teacher also. That means there are seven extra teachers in this parish uh, since, uh, say, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we had to build schools because the existing schools are too small, we had to extend schools, and uh, this development is obvious throughout the whole parish. We built a, a school in 19, we opened a school in 1956 to accommodate 80 children and clan money, and in two years it was too small. Things are very prosperous around here, there's plenty of work, and uh, I, I, I can foresee this in a few in some few today that uh, our population will be doubled in, I'd say, in a very short time. Mm. Mr McMahon, uh, what has the County Council done for all this? For the past 20 years or so, there have about 70 houses built for the, for the working class here uh, at Shannon, and uh, we, uh, at our meeting this week we, we have passed another scheme of houses for this place which will be started as soon as possible for no applicants. Yes. So there's uh, young people getting married every day and we, 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 we have to try and get houses for them, you see. Uh, this private, there's private enterprise with this man, contractors building houses here for people that's, uh, that's looking from and, uh, and uh, he's prepared to build. We have, he has the whole field taken here from the owner to build additional houses if required. Another sign of this prosperity is that two garages and two filling stations and even a bookmaker's shop have grown up in the village. This is all a welcome sign at a time when people in other parts are leaving the villages for the big towns. Here they are staying at home and growing prosperous. <laughs> excited and now that I have had time to think about it all I'm really beginning to realize what the competition means. Now the circumstances that led to you entering this contest were unusual to say the least. Would you like to tell mm -hmm. us about this? Well, I lost some money in the castle and later that night I was having tea. As a result a woman read my cup and she told me I would be in a place of entertainment and I would get some money as a result. So next day I saw it advertised for this Claire Rose in Lehinch. So I was on days off and I said I may as well go. So I went and arrived. There, and you say O'Brien. So not surprisingly, this ancient site of the hereditary chieftains of the clan date back to the 17th century. The present castle was completed in 1826. And in its forerunner was born William Smith O'Brien leader of the abortive rising of 1848. Designer of the castle was William Payne. 
who built it with the customary great entrance hall and the ground floor corridor from which reception rooms open right and left. At the end of this corridor lies the main staircase with its striking stained glass window and gracefully vaulted ceiling. The first floor gallery, with bedrooms off, retraces the ground floor corridor at this higher level. One of the many lovely pieces at this week's auction, a four compartment conversational seat, which sold for 80 pounds. Two decorative pilasters at the entrance to Lord Inchiquin's bedroom, and the fine portrait of Lord Inchiquin himself, Donna Edward Foster O'Brien, the 16th Baron. Ah, yes, a pair of Persian silver-mounted horse pistols, which sold for 40 pounds, and the silver of the establishment laid out under the gaze of past generations that used it. Take, for instance, this two-handled porringer, crested and inscribed J. Foster from Major Stansfield. It dates from 1697 and was auctioned this week for 60 pounds. One of these single barrel flintlocks sold for 100 pounds. And note the delicacy of the work on this basket hilt of fine rapier. An unusual item, this, a jester staff of silver and immediately above it, the portrait of Sir Lucius O'Brien. The spacious drawing room of Dremolan Castle, its richly gilded cornice and handsome chimney piece, gives it an air of elegance. A seven piece suite of early English painted satin wood, knocked down at 250 pounds, and one of a pair of Georgian celestial and terrestrial globes, which fetched the celestial figure of 330 pounds. A rare item, this, a Vatican fouchard as carried by the papal guards. It was bought in Rome in 1890. And brooding in the great hall over all this change is Jan Vick's immense 13th century likeness of Donatus O'Brien, one time King of Ireland. This hereditary seat of his descendants is soon to become a luxury hotel. But on portion of the old estate, Lord Inchquin builds a new family home, and the ancient O'Brien line will still be identified with the rolling lands of County Clare. I was out on the boat and um, there was quite a few within it and uh, there was some water coming in the boat so the crowd was on it got a bit panicky and uh, moved from one side of the boat to the other to get to a dry place so actually as, as they were moving more water started to come in so they started going from side to side until the more weight came in and the boat overturned. And uh, immediately after that, what happened? Well, all the people were on the water. So we shoved all we could onto the boat. It was, it, up, it was upside down and I swam for the shore. So we got another boat out to pick up the people that was clinging onto the boat. And we brought them to the far side. 
How many but people I exactly? Beforehand, before I went out, and I just saw the boat go over. And then I was with my sister, and we decided both to go out and to help to see uh, if we could get anybody. Are you a professional swimmer? Well, I've just passed my life saving exam. And how many did you actually save from the sea? Save two. Oh. Yes, we took a boat out and we picked out, we picked up the people who we had saved. And some others as well. And some others as well who were in the vicinity of the well, boat. Well, you, you were swimming with Rhea, is this true? No, I was in the boat. Yeah. Herself and her sister were swimming. And uh, we brought the boat back in then and we got them in, got them all. We went out again for some more. Well, was there Mr. Hugman, I understand that you played a real hero's part in the rescue of many yesterday. Could you tell me something about this? So this is not a question of being a hero, but trying to help children that were panic-stricken, helpless, unable to swim, afraid. No more than any other man would have done. I understand that you dived under the water and broke the windows of the cabin and also got a rope to take others out. Well, the point is that I couldn't do this um, Cathy Gaynor informed me when the boat turned turtle that there was children trapped in the cabin. I knew that the airlock that was in the cabin was the only thing that was keeping the hull afloat. I could do nothing for these children until I got the rest of the children off the upturned hull. The efforts from the shore to bring the lifeboat out was you've got a ship's lifeboat with a defunction engine in being dragged against the tide by a cork man who is a personal friend of mine mr Orley o'driscoll who made an absolute superhuman effort by tying a boat three times as large as the dinghy that he was rowing against a fast current he got so far and couldn't go any further. I then made fast a rope to the hull and swam to O'Driscoll. Made fast the rope into the dinghy and then swam back to the hull and hauled the dinghy and the lifeboat alongside. Everybody on the hull was then taken off. I was then left with the decision of what to do with the children in the cabin, knowing full well that when I released the airlock in the cabin, the boat would sink within seconds. I've never been faced with a more difficult situation in all my life. I dived under the boat to try and open the door to enter the cabin to get the children out. The water pressure on the door was that great I couldn't move it. I then surfaced, went round to the bow of the boat, dived again, kicked open the forward port light, extracted one girl and two young boys. This left the cabin clear. The boat then sank. When we arrived out near the, the boat, there were people clinging, plenty of people clinging to the upturned uh, boat. They seemed all right for the moment, so we looked around in the water and there were two girls swimming, Elsa and Rhea Stassen. They, they had, had swum out from the pier? They had dived from the pier and swum out, yes. And Rhea had two bodies in tow, Elsa another body. We, Tom and I hauled in the three bodies. There was no sign of life in any of them at the time. And the two girls then were pretty exhausted. We pulled them in. And when I got them into the boat, I saw that there was about six inches of water in it. And we couldn't lie them out, so we draped them over the seats with the heads down to drain out as best they could and applied artificial respiration. One of the difficulties then in the boat was that uh, trying to keep their faces out of the water in the boat in case they drowned in the boat. There have been reports that, in fact, the captain put off some children from this boat just before he took up, set off. Oh, this is true. My daughter actually is one of them. Um, Do you know how many? I think there were probably about 10 or 12 that um, he asked to leave the boat, actually put them ashore. And uh, then, seemingly, when he turned and went into the wheelhouse, 
And the boat was just casting off, about 10 or 12, jumped back on again, mainly boys. And uh, he would not have known about this. I'm sure he wouldn't have known about this because the view from the wheelhouse with a few people standing behind him, I had been out on a previous trip with him and I noticed this, that um, with the few people standing behind the wheelhouse that you couldn't really see who was in the back. So I'm quite sure he cast off and he didn't know he had 10 or 12 more on.